thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today we have two special guests directly from Germany, uh, Sasha and uh, on screen. Uh, and they will present Maurice. Maurice, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And they're representing their arcade machine and um, which are they showing on the out of games, no, and stuff like that. Yeah. And I will just give them the word. So, all right. Right. Thank you for coming. I mean, you, usually when we uh, exhibit, uh, people came to the event not to see us, but to see other things, and then they just sort of uh, stop by. Uh, and I forgot to ask, how do I move the slides? Oh. Okay, so use this. And this is up? No. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Sure. Right. So we made an arcade machine. We didn't just make it because we thought, well, let's make an arcade machine. There was sort of a process. Uh, we'll go through a few steps with this presentation. First, what we're even doing here, or what we're even doing in general. Uh, some of our games that we've already done. Then uh, our exhibitions at Gamescom, which were like coincidence more or less, and then how we came to this arcade machine, or how we built it. Um, so, first of all, I'm Sasha Smalley. Uh, I'm sort of the web development, now I'm hardware guy, now that we've made an arcade machine. I'm Slovenian, uh, and I'm actually like employed, I'm not just uh, coming to makerspaces in the afternoon. I'm employed, I work at the family-owned and run furniture manufacturing company. If my name rings a bell, that might be relevant. And Maurice, he's sort of the brain behind the operation. He, uh, he's the programmer, the main game designer, and basically he does most of the work and I just gloat in the, uh, in the fake, pretty much. Uh, he's from Germany, he's from around Cologne, uh, and he works as a web developer, even though that should be my thing. But now he does web development for a job, so I don't know. So Stanislav.net, we met sort of on a fluke. Uh, it's a long story. He's, he was the first to solve a riddle. And then we sort of, I guess, started hanging out in a way. Uh, and we became friends, and that was in 2010. And at that time, he was already making games. Uh, at the time, he made not Tetris, which some of you might recognize. Uh, and that was sort of the, his first full game that he released. That was before Stab Yourself existed. Uh, so, Stab Yourself sort of was founded because I said, oh look, your website looks garbage. Uh, maybe I could help you with that. So basically I, I helped him out with that and I said, oh, we could use like a cool brand. Uh, and before that I registered a domain StabYourself.net to be sort of used as a joke. Like put your name uh, in front of the domain, and then it does the magic where every subdomain works. It's, it's not magic. Uh, but basically, StabYourself.net gets made. Uh, we made a few games. Well, he made them. I, I helped out uh, with sort of design feedback and things that I like to say, but you know, he did most of the work still. Uh, we're most known for Mario, which is a Super Mario Brothers and Portal mashup, which you might have seen, probably some gifts of it will get to that. Uh, we started exhibiting at Gamescom in 2012, as I mentioned, uh, and we've been there every year. Uh, we've been exhibiting like multiple games. Uh, and yeah, that's basically what started this. And what continued this was for example, not Tetris 2, where he made it even worse, so now the lines actually get cut, so this game is actually infinitely playable now, but it's it's pretty playable, but uh, it's not as bad as not Pac-Man, which is Pac-Man with physics. I won't show you that because it's weird, but he likes it, I hope. Uh, and over there is sort of an original game made in... Uh, to be clear, all games were made in uh, Love 2D, which is a 2D game uh, framework based on Lua. And Ortho Robot is an example, sort of an isometric puzzle thing, which I don't know any good game examples, but I guess Fez would be a sort of a comparison. I don't know games. 
he knows games better than I do. So Mario is what we're most known for. And it's if we look at just numbers, it's our biggest success. It's had uh, 3.16 million downloads since March 2012. We're still getting 7,000 downloads per day, per month. Per day is a bit extreme. Uh, we've had four people email us, oh, I had this idea before, but you stole it, so please credit me and things like that. We ignored them, more or less. Uh, zero DMCA requests, hopefully that stays the same. And suddenly our community, which is after six years and not really much games released lately, still pretty active. Uh, they're suddenly doing speedruns of Mario map packs and in, uh, on Saturday at, at, three two, in the at 3 in the morning, there's going to be a tool assisted speedrun of one of the map packs in this game, which is pretty cool. So Gamescom. We came to Gamescom sort of on a fluke. Uh, like we've been to Gamescom, Maurice has been there a year before I believe. I went there in 2010, pretty much the year uh, uh, after I uh, met him. And uh, every year, well the first year we were like, oh, well we're just normal visitors, we should go as trade visitors. So we did go the next year. And we said, oh, maybe uh, next year we should go as exhibitors. And then we did, by a fluke, because there is a retro games area at Gamescom, uh, which sort of has, well, basically old consoles and there's some developers, but it's mostly old consoles, old computers, and it's a place where a lot of people sort of return, return to. And we managed to get a space there, which is free of charge for us, which is great. Uh, by the organizer of this retro area, who gave us uh, sort of a space and uh, we were able to sort of put whatever we wanted here. At first we were just saying, oh, we could like just give you our games and you can exhibit them, they're cool. And they were like, well, you could just exhibit. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's basically the gist. So when we found out, okay, we can exhibit at Gamescom, like besides all the logistical problems of getting the PCs, the monitors, the, the cables, all the other stuff, and getting them to Germany if we don't get them from Germany. We had a pretty clear idea of what we needed to do, for the games at least. So, first of all, it should be simple and intuitive, which is, I guess, sort of a given for games in general, but for Gamescom you have literally three seconds to catch someone's attention. Uh, there is a GDC talk uh, that's, that goes a lot in more into detail into that, so if anyone's interested, just let me know. Uh, we need to lock out users from breaking things. Uh, so, any exposed USB ports are already a terrible idea. Uh, we need to restart games because we don't want to just stand behind players and see, okay, is this going to break within the next five minutes or can I turn around, go get lunch? Oh, it broke already. So, that was sort of a concern we had. So, even if the game gets interrupted, at least it restarts and then the player isn't as mad, or maybe they're even more mad. So multiplayer is a thing that we wanted to do uh, because local multiplayer is a thing that I guess Nintendo has been trying to revive for a while uh, with their consoles. But uh, usually, <coughs> it's, a, it's a perfect uh, it's a perfect storm of people actually getting together who are friends and who would play together. So if you put up multiplayer games like four player or two player or anything like that, uh, it's going to be successful pretty much no matter what game it is, unless it's really terrible. So we said, okay, we should do four-player Mario, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, one thing that we sort of maintain still is we should do a hands-off approach, which means, like, okay, the players come by, they see the game, they come and they play the game, and we don't interfere. We don't say, oh, look, you can press this button to get points or a life or jumping powers or something. None of that. Uh, the games we exhibited were pretty simple and pretty well known, but, you know. At, uh, at an expo, you, get, you still get surprised after that many years. And we wanted to make everything look professional. Which is kind of sort of my uh, nitpicky thing, which isn't that important, but what we don't want is literally printing our name on an A4 paper and then sticking it to the wall, because that looks terrible. So this was our first booth. This is in 2012. On the left, you see Mario 4 Player, 
uh, with on the Super Mario Brothers uh, level with Xbox 360 controllers, so you could use one stick to move, one stick to aim, the portal gun, which is useful because then the players can just put, put portals uh, below each other and then cause them to die and then they have fun. That's how it usually works. Uh, next to it is not Pac-Man, which is the Pac-Man in physics, which has a steering wheel, which looks ridiculous enough to attract attention. Uh, next to it is not Tetris 2, which has an NES controller, so it's basic controls and it's Tetris with physics, but it's playable, so that's cool. And on the right most one, we have Mario Puzzle Level, so it's basically uh, the sort of Mario Portal default map pack where you have portal type puzzles that you have to resolve. So, how was our first year? Uh, brilliant, four player people come in, if it's only two players, uh, two players just say, okay, let's start a game, and then they play for two levels so they finish, or most of the time we, we got a group of four people, and then another group of four people waiting behind them, and they just went through the entire game. Usually by skipping a few worlds, but still they did. Not Pac-Man. That was weird, but people played it and enjoyed it. Uh, not Tetris 2. Awesome. Uh, the NES controller is the most basic controller, so if you're exhibiting something and you can put your game on an NES controller, that's great. Mario Puzzle Levels, that was a terrible idea, because the keyboard is complicated, a mouse is complicated, and people don't have the attention span. Uh, so, we got a banner, it does a job, it's fine. Uh, the, monitor, uh, the screen is big for the four players, so people can sit around, okay. Uh, those two are cool, Th that's just weird. Uh, that was horrible, uh, it was a horrible idea, the puzzle levels, because if you have multiple levels and they get harder, and a player leaves in the middle of the hard level, then the next player gets in the middle of the hard, play, or the hard level, which is kind of bad. And this is an ugly mess. So I mentioned earlier, exposed USB ports is a bad idea. Like, I don't need to explain what you can do, even if you lock everything out, someone will either pull out the power cable or what can I do. It's a mess. So here's some player, just to prove that we didn't just have an empty booth. We did have players. There were a lot of players. They were the best players. Next year, we did basically the same thing, except this time we had Mario time trials. And we also did less of a mess below the tables. This caused a lot of people to look, oh, what's running the game? Is it just on the monitor? But it's a lot neater. They're just a controller. We, we remotely manage the PCs via Wi-Fi using TeamViewer at the time, now with Type VMC. So everything worked out great. And we had a lot of players. We had some speedrunners uh, drop by. That's actually Adam AK, which is a cool guy. We've met him, I guess. That's nice. And here's, uh, here's another thing we did. We collected the runs of each player and then we put them together into one video, which is on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, there were, I think, so in the five or six days that the games come around, we had 976 runs or so. So that's cool, that worked out. The next year, we did the same thing. We said, okay, the formula is great, but we wanted to do more, but we said, okay, this is a safe thing. We can get the computers, we can get the, the hardware. So we just basically did the same, and it was successful. People still play, then they still do after that many years. So that's great. In 2015, we had an opportunity that we actually were looking for for a while. Because when we were, locking, we were walking around uh, on the assembly day of Gamescom, which is basically Monday, Tuesday, when everything's being assembled and you're just walking past pallets with a hundred boxes of a uh, hundred euro mouses just lying there. Uh, we were looking around, we saw a lot of LED pa uh, panels and LED walls and cool things like that. And we said, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could play a game on that? Because no one really lets you do that. There are, I guess, events where you can play them in a movie theater, but LED walls are cooler. So we had an opportunity, but what do we put on it? There is a limitation. Uh, it's a pretty big wall, but the resolution is 96 times 64. So we wanted to do something for two players with simple game rules, nothing weird, nothing out of the ordinary, just something that people know. So we did do that. We did six games 
Planck Tetris Tron 100 meter dash asteroid space invaders. And we did it so it's in randomized order. And there's three stages which sort of you play uh, two games in each stage and then you get different kind of amounts of points. It's sort of, the points don't really matter as much, uh, but uh, if you're competing with your friend, then it's a lot more uh, sort of intense if you're actually trying to beat each other or if you're having a rematch, which is what happened. So what happened is we got a wall. It's 3.6 times 2.4 meters. We also got the standard stuff on the other side. Uh, we, got, we made a uh, custom stand for our controller that we had, an arcade X controller, which is basically just a, a fighting game joystick, or joystick uh, game pad, I guess. Uh, so we built that, and even though this looks small, this is pretty big. Uh, that's a standard Windows mouse, that's my arm. Uh, it's pretty big. It looks small in the pictures, that's why I took this one. Just so you know, it's it's a big wall, and it was pretty bright, and that was the thing that caught a lot of attention, and people could see it from 50 or 60 meters away without an issue, because that was the highest thing in the hall at the time. Uh, and we had a lot of players. We had people waiting for 30 minutes in a line just to play a round of the game, and each round takes five minutes, so that's, I guess, six, five, six groups waiting in a row. And we still had the same thing. Uh, as we used to the previous year. So, four player, uh, not Tetris, not Pac Man, and the time trials. Next year, we couldn't get the LED wall, and it was terrible. So, we, we, what we had to settle for is a projector, which, if you can see this projector, you can see it's not the best. That we had a short throw projector, which was not the worst, but the hole was well lit. And you could see the game because it was pretty much white on black, but it's still not very impressive. We did do something new, which we wanted to do every year, like innovate something, even if it's not major. We got a printer, but I'll get to more details when we get to the machine. So when we got around to 2017, we realized that well, we probably won't be able to get the machine. So. What do we do? Projectors are terrible, LED walls are awesome. And if we can't rent one, and we only rented that one because we got it really cheap, like one tenth of the price, which was still expensive, but you know. So if we can't rent one, we'll just have to make one, but we can't fit them in a car, because we don't really own a van, we just have two cars that we can use at most. So, we decided, okay, an arcade machine, those are cool, what if we put LED panels in there? So that's how Super Battle Arcade, which is what I guess we now call the machine, came about. So there were some requirements. Basically, the long story is we have to fit it in my car, disassemble, and not, uh, not die disassemble. So what we disassemble will no piece bigger than 100 times 80, and I don't want to take apart every screw of the controller or every screw of the uh, LED panels because that's just a lot of work. And you've seen that we've already taken, I think, an hour or so to assemble this one, or maybe 45 minutes, that's the last time. So what we ended up doing is designing the arcade machine so it, so it uh, splits apart into assemblies. So we have the top assembly, which is the, uh, the LED panel and the Raspberry Pi, which controls it. We have the middle panel, which has the speakers and the printer. We have the controller box, which has the controllers and is at an angle for, I guess, uh, more ergonomics and so that people don't put beer on it. And the bottom panel, well, the bottom panel, the bottom assembly, which is the biggest, so it has to disassemble into parts. But it's still manageable because every part is still small enough to fit in a car. And this does fit in my uh, Ford Focus and it does fit in Maurice's Ford Fiesta, so we're not even having really any major issues transporting it. But it's a lot of work to, to pack. We can still do it though. It's 150 kilos in total, but it's manageable. We did it today and we'll have to do it again today, which is just <laughs> awesome. But uh, I'm just hoping you won't play until midnight, so we'll be home by Thursday, I guess. So, 
The display, the most interesting part of this, probably. The most eye-catching part of this. It's got 12 pieces of 320 times 160 LED panels, which have a resolution of, uh, I don't know, but it works out to 96 times 64. The same as we had before. It's a nice sort of resolution. It's 4x3, I hope, I think. Is it 4x3? It's 3 by it's the surface, uh, it's the Microsoft surface. <laughs> so, and what we did, uh, what we decided to do is we wanted to get uh, outdoor LED panels, which are uh, a lot more brighter than indoor panels. For example, these go up to 6,000 candela per square meter, and high end uh, HDR TVs go up to 1,000, I think. Uh, and the panels can also be updated at 1,200 uh, 1, Hz. We're not running it at that much, we're running it at half that, so, so we don't destroy the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we do need two 300 uh, watt power supplies to power uh, the LED panels, like not at uh, full power, but there's some spare, but they do get scarily loud sometimes. Uh, we have a Raspberry Pi, which you can see in the bottom there. We had to put a fan there because it overheats and then it just dies. Uh, and what the Raspberry Pi does is basically just digest the data that the game sends over the network just as raw data, just basically RGB one after another, all the pixels, and it takes in 80-ish uh, megabits per second of just raw uh, data, because it runs at usually around 500 FPS. Uh, the game does, and as well the it, it runs on the computer and the uh, display, just to be clear. It's not just interlacing fancy display thing, it's actually running that fast. So we can see here, uh, what you can see here is that we got a 3D printer and we sort of went mad. Uh, we made sort of a stand for the fan so it sort of heats the, cools it down a bit more efficiently. Uh, because we did have overheating issues and the first year I had to sort of screw it in sort of by hand and I just had to find the fan somewhere. And every, every LED panel, like you can see most of it here, it just, it's, just, uh, it's just a PCB with a power connector and there's, and there's a connector for the uh, data input and there's the data output which goes to the next panel. And it looks weirdly uh, arranged, but that's because we had three channels, or sort of like three uh, columns that we had to run, and because it's three columns vertical, we just did it like that. But usually that would be just straight ahead, uh, and you would have as many uh, kind of basic sort of connectors to the output device, or I guess the Raspberry Pi, and then you have in height. So up next was the speaker assembly or rather the speakers, because that's sort of a distinction, you have more stuff in there. We don't know anything about sound, so we got an amplifier and a subwoofer and uh, some speakers, and it works. Th that, that's how we did it. We, it. Yeah, that looks fine, okay. I mean, we calculated sort of the volume for the subwoofer that we need, but that was about as far as we went. But everything works fine, which is great because we didn't know anything. So this is sort of, the speakers are just assembled, uh, the main speakers are there, but the subwoofer is below, so it shakes your legs. So up next is the printer. I mentioned that we had the printer when we had the terrible projector. Uh, and that was sort of the innovation. On the right you see, after each game, you get a receipt, or I guess a proof of game, if you want to call it that. And it shows you the results and which player won, and it thanks you for playing and asks you to recycle. <laughs> and what we did the first year, we just got like a sort of standard uh, point of sale printer. We just put it sort of on a shelf so it was kind of hidden, and it just printed out a receipt. And then people said, oh, wow, a receipt. And then they took it, and most people took it, which was pretty cool. Even though people don't really like taking receipts. <laughs> uh, but we had an issue. Uh, the year after, the first year we made an arcade machine, just to be clear, we made the arcade machine in 2017, we exhibited it in twice so far, 2017 and 2018. Uh, what we're looking at now, on the presentation and in, I guess, in person, is sort of the upgrade that we did over the New Year's, which has a new printer. 
because what we found out is that the only thing that breaks is that our Chinese 4 euro printer, uh, it prints the paper and then it cuts it, but the, the paper comes out before, uh, before it's done printing or cutting. So what happens a lot is that when you have someone who probably loses, uh, it's not that they're just having a bad day, but they also lost the game horribly, they just pull out the paper, and I didn't want to do that, they just pull out the paper fast sideways, and then the printer jams and that's horrible, and then we had to sort of jam the paper back in and it was the worst thing ever. So we said, okay, let's get this printer, this one's 400 euros. <laughs> But what it does is it has a printer, like, I mean, it's an industrial grade printer, it's basically, it's a zebra, so that's basically the Maserati of printers. <laughs> so what this one does is print, and there's another motor in the front, which is the presenter, and what it basically does is, it first prints it, and then it sort of loops up, and then when it's printed and cut, then the presenter sort of pushes it out, and then even if you pull it sideways, it won't jam the printer. Unless you try really hard, but we haven't managed to do it so far, which is good because we don't want to deal with that. So like I said, print, uh, the paper is printed after each game, we'll each get a paper if we'll play the game, I hope you will. That, I mean, we put a lot of work into putting this here, there's stairs and everything. So please take the receipts and don't put them on the floor, please recycle. Here's a bit more of our uh, 3D printing madness. Like we had to do a sort of a thing that sort of guides the paper at the right angle because this printer has a 50 page guide on how to integrate it into your machine, which I read, of course. And what we also did is because we didn't want to deal with tiny uh, pools, spools of uh, paper, which are only 30 meters. What we got were sort of the smallest version of the industrial grade spools, which is 210 meters. So now we can do, I guess, a thousand games before we need to replace it, which is pretty good, so we don't have to worry about that ever, pretty much. And then there's sort of the simplest thing, the controller. Uh, we just sort of took apart the X arcade joystick thingy that we had a few years ago, uh, when we had the stand. Uh, back then we just uh, took out the buttons that we didn't want to use, uh, but now we said we want it done properly. And because the controller had sort of a COM port and then you had to use uh, an adapter, what I decided to do is just uh, take a Cherry keyboard controller and then sort of plug it in there and then the game just takes whatever inputs that gives, which is probably some weird piece because everything is something like that. Uh, but that's basically uh, most of the interactable parts of it. So the bottom part is just the, the trash, there's a PC running Windows 10, uh, there's a router which we use for management, well, which is what Maurice used earlier when he was setting up the machine, and basically this is, this is the part where we hope nothing breaks. Uh, up next, the software. So the software, which was sort of the, the most important part before we made the machine, but now the machine is the most important part. Uh, the game is made in Lua, on a uh, love framework, used for many games, I suppose. And what you can see there is some uh, bit of code which uh, I believe sends the data to the Raspberry Pi. So it runs on Windows, you can run it on other machines, but we run it on Windows because we're most familiar with it. So as I said earlier, uh, the game sends raw data over the network to the Raspberry Pi, which sort of processes it and then displays it. Uh, that uh, the LED panel views uh, Henner Zellers, I think, if that's his name. Uh, he, on GitHub he has sort of a library and uh, uh, sort of blueprints for a dollar board that you plug into a Raspberry Pi to sort of act as a controller. Like, if any of you work with LED panels, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, but we can look at it a bit closer later. Uh, and the, what the game do also does is it generates the receipts, it just makes an image and then the, it processes that into whatever, uh, whatever printer language we use. We used to use EPS, which is sort of the box standard Canon type, 
Now we use KPL, which is the weird Zebra type, but not the fancy Zebra type, because this is the cheapest printer they have. Uh, but yeah, everything pretty much runs on love. Uh, regarding the game, or how cool he is, you can ask Maurice after the presentation, because I don't know any of the code, because I've never seen it before, until now. I just want it to work. That's basically it of what I have to say, I think. I mean, what I thought to say, I didn't plan this at all. So, are there any questions regarding the machine before we play it? How long did it take to make it, the whole machine to process? How long did it take? How long did it take you to make the whole machine? Um, I honestly have no idea. Like, just, uh, just the manufacturing, uh, I guess, of the basic panels took like uh, 12 hours, but that was mostly just screwing around, making sure it's correct. Uh, but everything pretty much worked on first try. So I'm pretty happy with that. I, I have no idea how long it took uh, to make this. We didn't log the time. Uh, the planning of the cabinet took a while. Uh, sort of getting the Raspberry Pi to work took a, lot, a long time. Uh, I mean, like more like in days, in like months. How long? <laughs> like, yeah. you have an idea? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like a month, two months. I mean, we worked on it like properly, it would probably take a while just because we needed to wait for the parts or figure something out or maybe you get an idea after two weeks of not working on it. So it's kind of hard to say, but I honestly have no idea. We spent a lot of time on it. Uh, over the New Year's when we did the upgrades, which basically just changed the printer, uh, converted everything to electric screws and made the, uh, the sort of the controller top a bit more resilient, that took us, I guess, five, six days, I guess. So let's say a month or two. Let's say three months. Let's say two years. <laughs> it took, I mean, to be fair, we did start on it in 2017, and now it's sort of complete, but I guess we'll probably find something else to change. I guess, yeah? So when you're testing this, you probably do it on PC first, but um, I mean, there's so many components. How do you do that? Just what you said, it just worked. That's amazing for... Uh, I mean, it didn't just work, uh, because we're sort of far apart and I had to do the cabinet and Maurice had to do uh, the LED panel code, we sort of had to um, collaborate a bit uh, remotely, so he had to sort of measure the distance between the holes for the LED panels uh, and I had to sort of hope that that's correct. Uh, so there was some experience, but he basically he had all the things that he needed when he needed them. Like there were some issues implementing the LED panels, for example, because they're uh, because LED panels work in a specific way. You have to send data in a specific order, so you have first have to send I don't know. For example, this is just an example. Uh, first really four rows, and then it's it's thirty two times sixteen panels. But to actually talk to them, you have to pretend like they're 64 times 8 panels, and every like block of 2 times 8 pixels is moved. It's, it's the weirdest panels. Yeah. I, I, I spent a whole day figuring out how the hell to make a proper image on the panel. Yeah, it took a while, but uh, basically anything that was not reversible, we didn't screw up. Um, like, for example, the sound thing, that was sort of... I guess a miracle that that worked out because we didn't know anything about sound. I don't know. I still don't know anything about sound at this point. Uh, but I mean, as far as everything working out, like he has experience programming. I have experience building cabin. Well, not really cabinets, but I have experience in woodworking, so I sort of knew how to make it stable. And this was stable without really any, you know, extra. Uh, sort of stability testing on anything like that. So it was, I guess, just a lot of experience that sort of preceded it, that made it easy to start working, well, to make the machine start working. But it's a lot of luck, it's a lot of experience. <laughs> now you have all this knowledge, and maybe have you uh, thought about in the future making more of them? We have thought of that, 
Uh, we have thought of making this into a product. There are some, uh, of course, like issues with it. Uh, for example, the StabYourself.net brand, uh, that's sort of poisoned because we did the, uh, the, the not Tetris and the Mario and it's, it's not the most legal thing, I guess. It's, uh, it's a very gray area. I mean, because we did take uh, assets from Nintendo and whatever and just put them in a game. Like, we don't have ads or we don't really make money. I mean, we're more losing money than anything. Uh, but yeah, I did think about uh, making this into sort of a product. I don't know what the price would be. I mean, just the bill of materials for this is over a thousand euros, so probably three to four thousand. Just to be clear, the, the printer is like 400 euros, so we might change the printer. Uh, but it's a good printer, so we'll probably leave that in. We'll, we'll may, maybe we'll think about sort of changing the speakers, but that's all sort of like a fever dream at this point. Uh, there's no concrete plans, really. Uh, we'd have to rename Tetris to blocks and uh, probably asteroids to rocks and space invaders to things. Uh, like things like that. There's also uh, another issue. Uh, I've talked to this. Uh, I've talked about this to to a guy uh, at uh, Dragonbox, who is uh, uh, well one of the uh, one of the guys who worked there at Gamescom. Uh, they did the uh, pyra and things like that. Uh, I asked him, well, how do you even sell uh, sort of an electronic product? And he said, well, if it's a kit and which basically means you can just have one connector unplugged then most of the sort of safety rules don't really apply because it's a kit and it's not sort of a, a full product so that sort of a thing i have to still research i looked into it a bit still no clear idea how to do it like maybe a kit sort of variant would work out because i mean if you want to put it in a car you have to disassemble it and then it's an hour of work and walking up the stairs um, but yeah, we thought about it, but no concrete plans for now. Which one fails the most? I mean, which one do you want to switch the plates? Uh, we haven't switched anything, really. I mean, the only thing we switched really that failed is uh, originally the, everything was made with sort of regular furniture with screws. Uh, but because uh, the machine has been assembled and disassembled so many times, it started failing. So that's why this year, or last year, I guess, we converted to use metric screws. And that's really the only thing that failed. The one thing that sort of failed is there's one pixel on the bottom right that's sort of weird and it's not green when it's supposed to be green. That's the only thing that really failed right now. Uh, and when we, when we had the LED wall, there were, because it was a rented wall, like we didn't really control how well it was maintained. Uh, we still paid money for it. Uh, the, the bottom most left panel was weird and if you punched it the, cor the correct way, it started working. Sometimes, <laughs> I mean, it, it was weird, but most of the time what we had is very little crashes. Uh, more things that we had, especially at Gamescom, uh, is when we found out, when we were looking so at someone playing, and we said, yeah, no, that's not good. That's not a, we should change that. Like a good example is, I think that was the first year, we had a guy, uh, I don't remember his name or anything, a guy from Gearbox Software came and he was playing uh, not Pac-Man, and in our infinite wisdom we made it reset the game if you're not active uh, for some amount of seconds, I guess 15 seconds or something. And he was playing it slow, slow sort of like a puzzle game, not like a racing game which you can't really do unless you're Maurice because he's good at it. Uh, so while we're watching him play and we talk to him, the game reset without a warning. And he was like, oh. And we were like, oh. <laughs> so since then, we made a golden rule. Every game, before it resets, it has to, well, since then, I mean, we, we sort of, I still think about that when we do sort of the reset timer and we can see it on the arcade machine. Uh, before it resets, it has to count down and it has to count down one more second than it actually does. So what we do on the arcade machine that you might see later is that it counts down to zero and then it sort of resets the game. So that's an example that we did on the arcade machine. 
Um, and obviously we've had bugs and things like that on the old... Uh, no, Maurice is saying there were no bugs ever. We, we had the weirdest things, like for example, we had the weirdest flukes. Uh, when we did the LED panel, uh, when we were setting it up, when we were setting up the arcade machine the first time, there was a flicker every 10 seconds or so. But only sometimes. <laughs> so what we figured out was, okay, it doesn't flicker when it's connected to the network. And this was my brilliant deduction. NTP was running, and it was interrupting the processor for long enough to make the screen flicker because it was running at 500 FPS. So we changed that. We also had a weird issue last year where OpenAL, which is uh, the sound library that uh, love to be uses, would just stop working, not even crash gracefully, it would just stop. So then that was a complete, I don't know how we figured that out, but we fixed that as well. Uh, but other than that, not really any major issues. That was a long answer. I mean, all my answers were long, but I, I hope they were interesting so far. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. What was the reason we built it? What was the reason we built it? Well, uh, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, I mean, there was a reason why we exhibited at Gamescom in the first place was, oh, we're exhibiting at Gamescom, which is, and still is, the biggest uh, gaming convention in the in the world, pretty much. Like E3, even though now it's sort of a more industry thing, or so they pretend, uh, it is a lot smaller, and I don't think it's ever been that big because it was never sort of about the crowd. Uh, so when we got the opportunity, we said, okay, cool, let's let's make it work. I mean, we had expenses, obviously, but we sort of took it as a vacation. Uh, because it was every year during sort of the vacation time. Uh, at, uh, the first year, I think we were both still in school. Uh, now we're employed, but we just uh, make the time so we can still exhibit there. Uh, and we do it every year since then. But not because it's... <coughs> Not because we gain anything from it, but because it's cool. And the same, the same thing was with the LED wall. Like we didn't say, oh, this is gonna, uh, I don't know, increase our ROI or something. No, we paid for for that uh, LED wall. We paid 500 euros uh, to get it rendered, which is like one tenth of the price we would usually have to pay, especially for to rent it for a week. Uh, but we still did it because it was cool. Now, to be clear, we do get a lot of hardware uh, rented for free. For example, the school I went to, and I still haven't finished for some reason, I don't know why, uh, the director is kind enough to still rent me, or I guess lend me, uh, the computers and some of the monitors that we need. And I'm always thankful for, for him, and every year I tell him, oh, I'll get my diploma soon. <laughs> that never worked out. So, I forgot what the question, what was the question? Did this answer your question? Oh yeah. oh yeah, why didn't we do this? It's cool, it's cool, and we could do it. Like an arcade machine is not something that anyone could do. Like, uh, I have a woodworking experience, obviously. Uh, I still have all my fingers, believe it or not. Uh, but I have woodworking experience, and I have sort of the technical know-how to do a lot of different things. So this was sort of a, nice, uh, I guess, uh, cooperation between me, the hardware guy, and Reese, the software guy. So, it was really the best thing we could probably bring to Gamescom, because, uh, like I mentioned earlier at some point, uh, every year we wanted to add something new, like even if it was a minor thing. For example, in 2018, uh, we, had, we, we still had the time trials, of course, uh, but Maurice said, oh, we could do something that uploads the, the, your play, your, like your entire replay, uploads it to the internet and then shows the QR code. And then you can scan it and look at it on your phone and be like, wow, I'm so slow compared to this guy. No one used it. He spent 30 hours programming that. No one used it once. There were two, there were two links used, and that was both in testing. No one used it. It was, it was awful. I mean, it wasn't awful. The code is still there, but it was kind of a waste of time, so... Yeah.
but it's cool. It was cool, but I guess we won't use it next year because it's kind of a kind of a waste of screen time, I guess. I guess that's all for that question. Anything else? Any questions? No. <laughs> I guess we're done. <laughs>